Thank you. Uh, I'm Karen Wickery, and I work in corporate communications. I'm very happy to welcome Jeff Nunberg this afternoon. I've been pulling for him for a long time. You may have heard his commentaries on fresh air over the years. Uh, you may have run across his commentaries on language usage and uh, perhaps incidentally his frequent mentions of Google as an indicator of the changing ways in which we use words. Uh, Jeff is a linguist who teaches at the School of Information at Berkeley. Um, he's the chair of the usage panel for the American Heritage Dictionary. His commentaries on language have been on Fresh Air since 1987 and, uh, and appear in the Sunday New York Times and elsewhere. Um, he's written other books, as you may know, and um, I consider him a natural language processor. Please welcome Jeff Nunberg. <laughs> Do we have, we have, oh yeah, oh yeah. Um, so it's, it's great to be here. Uh, co uh, coming to Google, it's, 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 it's not really a, a, a very alien place for me, partly because there's so many people here uh, whom I knew in my days at, at Xerox Park. Uh, we were counting, we counted, we stopped at 10 or 12, but uh, uh, I don't know. And, and then other people who are um, uh, former students at the school, what's now the School of Information uh, at Berkeley where I teach. And in fact, um, uh, uh, John Lamping and Mike Dixon have both uh, come to lecture to my classes there, so I, I feel very good about being here. Um, but what I'll be talking about um, uh, today is not um, uh, the sorts of things I did in park days or do at the School of Information now, but uh, rather uh, my new book, or new as of uh, July, uh, Talking Right, um, where's this, uh, with a rather long subtitle, uh, how conservatives turn liberalism into a tax raising, latte drinking, sushi eating, Volvo driving, New York Times reading, body piercing, Hollywood loving, left wing freak show. Uh, I'll tell you in a moment, a little bit later, where that, where that title came from. Uh, the, the subject of the book um, is the language of politics, um, and particularly uh, the kind of concern that Democrats and liberals uh, have had uh, about what seemed to them to be their linguistic failures over uh, recent decades. Um, when you looked in particular at the things that people were saying after the 2004 uh, uh, elections, uh, there seemed to be a general sense that Democrats had simply lost uh, the linguistic, or had been uh, linguistically routed. Ellen Goodman, these are two quotes, are typical of the hundreds you could find. Uh, Ellen Goodman, the columnist, the entire moral voc vocabulary is now a wholly owned uh, language of the religious right. Uh, the DNC chair, Terry McAuliffe, uh, at the time DNC chair, we've got to start talking to these people in red states with a language that resonates with them, and so on and so forth. Everybody pointing to the language, why? Because it seemed to Democrats as if they had been um, uh, advocating for years policies uh, that were to the best advantage of large numbers of working Americans, uh, that somehow, that appealed to working Americans uh, in the sense that uh, working Americans did agree that the Democrats were better on taxes and the environment and so on. But those people would then uh, systematically vote for Republicans against, uh, it seemed to Democrats, what were uh, their own best interests. And how could that happen, Democrats asked, unless Republicans were spinning a snappy line of patter that uh, somehow deluded people about where uh, their interests lay. Um, uh, and when people talked about uh, the linguistic problems of the Democrats, they naturally turned to what seemed to be uh, the, the greater skill of the Republicans in coining slogans and catchphrases, what I think of as the bumper sticker wars. And it's certainly true that if you look at the language of American politics over the last 20 years or so, the right has had all the best lines. Uh, compassionate conservatism, clear skies, healthy forests, no child left behind, ownership society, partial birth, abor partial, partial birth abortion, death tax, uh, more recently cut and run. I mean, you just, every day I, I uh, uh, open a paper, go to Google News, and there's, there's a new one there. This, this, uh, if you write about this stuff, you really don't, you have mixed feelings about it the prospect of this administration being replaced because it's a wonderful source of material. <laughs> uh, uh, whereas, um, uh, you know, when you think of uh, what the uh, Democrats come up with, well, Social Security lockbox, uh, single-payer health care, 
uh, versus cut and run, they have redeployment. Uh, I mean, you know, pick, pick people off a bus on El Camino and, and, and ask them what single payer health care makes. And, you know, you'll, you'll be a long time waiting on that street before you come up with anybody who knows what that phrase means. Uh, as Joe Klein, the Time columnist, said, a chronic democratic woe uh, is lousy bumper stickers. Um, and the idea that the Republicans' advantage lay in this ability to coin these um, uh, effective misleading phrases is a very alluring one uh, in, in the age of Orwell or in the age in which uh, uh, high-priced naming consultants and branding consultants earn big uh, uh, consulting fees for coming up and offering you a set of syllables that's going to put your IPO over the top or put your product on the shelves and so on. It's, it, 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 arguably, there's never been an age uh, with such a naive faith in the power of language, even though there's also never been an age that's so skeptical of it, but that's, that's another issue. Um, nonetheless, do bumper stickers really matter? Um, well, it's kind of hard to, 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 to say if they do or not. Clearly, they have some influence uh, on the way people perceive the issues. But the fact is that despite all those phrases like clear, uh, clear skies and healthy forest and so on, uh, uh, no child left behind, voters still give the Democrats the advantage over the Republicans on the environment, on education, on taxes, on Social Security, and all of those uh, issues, voters throughout have given a, a Democrats the advantage. Those haven't persuaded voters that the Republicans are better on those issues. They they may have taken um, uh, some of the uh, they, they 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 may have taken some of the negative connotations that Republicans had uh, away. They may have softened uh, the image of Republicans as at least as willing to pay lip service. I mean, what what's compassionate conservatism after all? But uh, paying lip service where lip service is due, and and the Republicans have been very good at that. Um, when you look, uh, take, take for instance the phrase the death tax in place of the estate tax. Every liberal's favorite example of the duplicitous and deceptive use of language by the Republicans. Uh, at the same time, when you look at the national election surveys, which are the big surveys uh, uh, done annually or every, every two years, um, and you ask people, do you favor repeal of the death tax or do you favor repeal of the estate tax? Uh, turns out that the choice of one or another of those phrases only moves opinion by one or two points, very small. Uh, a small amount. Now, it turns out also that a, a, a great majority of voters at all income levels do support repeal of the death tax, even though it only applies to a tiny less than 1% of, of, of taxpayers. That's another problem. But it's not one that has to do with the choice of one or another bumper sticker to describe uh, the problem. Or, or finally, consider uh, the choice of uh, private versus personal accounts to describe the administration's proposals for, as they called it, reforming uh, Social Security. Uh, around November of, uh, of uh, 2004, uh, the, Demo the Republicans started to say, you know, this phrase privatization and private accounts are misleading. We're not really trying to privatize. We want you to use personal accounts. And, and the press really played ball. If you look at uh, press citations and broadcast citations for those phrases, personal accounts and private accounts, to describe the administration's proposals, uh, over the, uh, the uh, six months or so following uh, the Rep Republicans' insistence that uh, the, the, the phrase personal accounts be used, it, uh, the per percentage of, of references to personal accounts over private accounts almost doubled. Really, it went up by about 50 or 60 percent, I think. Um, nonetheless, uh, through in that period, uh, it wasn't as if support for the administration's proposals built. On the, other, uh, on, on the contrary, the proposal was pretty much dead in the water. By the, end of, uh, by the end of 2005. So uh, in all of these cases, it's very hard to make a case that the catchphrases and slogans, very skillfully coined by Republicans, have been decisive in moving public opinion. Does that mean that uh, the Republicans don't have or haven't had a linguistic advantage? No, but we may be looking for it in the wrong place. Where you really want to look for this advantage, and that's the, 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 the burden of my book, is in the use of what I think of as the final vocabulary of American, polit American political discourse, borrowing a phrase from the philosopher Richard Rorty, the, the words that ordinary people use in their conversations about politics over the, at the breakfast table, at the bowling alley, uh, around the water cooler, uh, a, 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 and so forth. Um, uh, the, the basic symbol words, to take Walter Lippmann's phrase, uh, 
uh, that, as he, Lippmann put it, assemble emotions after they've been attached from their ideas. These are not words that, uh, this isn't to say that these are words you can't think about and analyze, but they're words that people don't think about and analyze. They just use as kind of tokens in a conversational game about politics. And let me just say that when I talk about political language, I'm thinking not only of the language that comes down that we hear over the radio or read over the internet or in the, in the newspaper, but the language that people actually use and, and that the media use. And in this connection, I'll give some examples here. I've used various databases, including uh, um, uh, the, the web as indexed by Google and other search engines, to see what peop how people are actually talking about politics. And <clears throat> what, what you see when you look at the way these words are used, these basic words, is that uh, the, the words are used consistently in a way that presupposes a right-wing point of view. And this is true not just on Fox News and uh, the Washington Times and the, the, the conservative, National Review, conservative sources where you would expect to see this. It's also true in the so-called liberal media, as Eric Alterman uh, uh, calls them, the New York Times, the Washington Post, uh, CNN, and uh, so forth. And I'll give examples as, as, as we go along, but I mean, just to take an example, if you look at domestic political context, the phrase conservative values anywhere from three to five times as common as liberal values in the New York Times and the Washington Post and so on. You don't have to go to Fox News to find out. Fox News, it's even higher. But, but you don't have to go to the, the conservative media to see this. It's, it's everywhere. This is the way everyone talks about politics. The, uh, the, uh, the right has succeeded in actually moving the center of gravity of, of American political language to the right. Um, <coughs> now, liberals, are, of course, are, are not unaware of this. Uh, but I think the problem liberals have had is in assuming that the, the magic of these words, the power of these words, consisted in the words themselves, that there's something, say, about the words values uh, that conveys a certain idea, and that what liberals have to do is recapture values, that word, the V word, for themselves. They've been trying to do this for, uh, for more than 20 years. Uh, Geraldine Ferraro, in her um, vice presidential acceptance speech at the 1984 Democratic Convention, says, to those concerned about the strength of American and family values, as I am, I say we're going to restore those values. I don't know why that hyphen is there. Uh, the Kerry Edwards campaign, uh, 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 20 years later, uh, bills itself as a celebration of American values, and so on. Democrats, in fact, had probably used the word values more often than Republicans did uh, during the 2004 campaign. Um, nonetheless, as I say, when you look at the media, when you look at the way people talk, when you listen to the way people talk about this stuff, values still belongs to the right. And that's because there's no magic in the word values itself. I mean, values in particular, it isn't a word like freedom that's historically been a, 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 a part of American political discourse. Values was not an important, politically important word uh, uh, before the early 1970s. I doubt if it will be an important political word uh, 20 or 30 years from now. If it has uh, a value as a token, if it has a weight as a token, it's because the right has very successfully used this uh, as uh, a... Um, a kind of file label for a, a file of clippings. I'll come to this in a moment, but the point is that words like values and elite and liberal and so on don't have meaning in virtue of their dictionary definitions of the frames associated with them, but rather in virtues of the kinds of narratives that they evoke, the, the stories they trail in their wake. To, to, to give an example of how this works, take a word like appeasement. You look this up in the American Heritage Dictionary, uh, and it says uh, the policy of granting concessions to political enemies to maintain peace, right? That's a good definition uh, of the word. And if you took that word at face, that definition at face value, it's a reasonable description of the policy that both uh, Clinton and Bush uh, have followed, for example, in trying to deal with North Korea, both policies of appeasement in the dictionary sense of the term. Nobody would ever use the word appeasement to describe uh, either of those policies because the fact is that appeasement means more than that. When you say the word, you evoke uh, this, uh, this historical narrative of uh, Hitler and uh, film clips of Hitler uh, saluting uh, of uh, Neville Chamberlain uh, with his droopy mustache, of uh, Churchill glaring balefully over his, uh, defiantly over his cigar, of German troops moving into the Sudetenland and so on. All of that story uh, in, in, is implicit in that word and that's where the action is. Well, similarly with a word like value, values in the plural, uh, the Oxford English Dictionary defines as the principles or standards of a person or society. In that sense of the word, the Democrats have them, the Republicans have them, you have them, I have them, everybody has some values or, or other. But when that word is used in American political discourse, it too evokes 
a whole set of images, uh, the Ten Commandments monument in Alabama, flag burning, uh, the Pledge of Allegiance, the war on Christmas, uh, and the, you know, the kids in Texas, Plano, Texas, who were forbidden from wearing red and green to school at Christmas time, and one story that was widely circulated. Uh, gay marriage, the woman in England who married a dolphin, which is what will happen if we allow gay marriage to, uh, to, to be. Um. <coughs> and all of these stories, which, which are routine fare on uh, the, the cable networks and, and, and talk radio and so forth, and, in, and in, in the press, standing in for this larger arch narrative about an America divided into two nations, uh, the good, simple, folks of the heartland, the middle Americans of, of, of red America, whose personal sta standards of personal morality and patriotism and religious faith are being ridiculed and, 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 and traduced by these uh, self-important, uh, uh, pretentious, uh, upper middle class, effete Eastern and West Coast liberals and so on. This, this, this narrative um, that has dominated the rhetoric of the right in one form or another, really since the Nixon Agnew years when the Southern strategy was, 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 uh, was first implemented, um, and that in one way or another, when you listen to the Republican and right wing rhetoric on any issue from uh, uh, torture uh, to or prisoner interrogation to taxes uh, to gay marriage, whatever the issue is, you're going to hear one or another version of this, of, of, of this narrative. It's, a, it's an all purpose narrative that has shaped. Uh, the way, the, the, the language that, that's associated with it. Um, how, have the, how, have the, how has the right gotten a, a managed to succeed with this? Well, it's a long story, and I won't have that much to say about it today, although there's more in the book. Um, <coughs> it has a lot to do, and I'll argue this in a, in a moment, with the Democrats' linguistic and political factlessness. I mean, it, it isn't as if the right did this without any help from the Democrats. The Democrats have been singularly um, uh, uh, inept uh, in dealing with pro political rhetoric. It also has to do uh, with the discipline and coordination of the right, um, the connections between uh, the right-wing think tanks, the Republican Party, uh, the right-wing broadcasters, uh, the, the ability of the right um, through those connections and through a, a, a kind of collective discipline to stay on message. Um, one example I, I mentioned in the book, and I, I can't help uh, repeating here, uh, but repeat here. Um, I took, when I was at Xerox Park, I took um, uh, all of the speeches of the first two days of the Republican Convention uh, in 1996 and put them in one big file and ran uh, uh, an extraction summarizer that Julian, I don't know if Julian Kupiak is here, he's at uh, 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 Google now, that Julian Kupiak had written uh, on them, just playing around with the, the summarizer and so on. And it came up with a speech that could stand in for every Republican speech that's been given over the last 30 years. I mean, it was the perfect Republican speech. It just pulled out because it's looking at frequency. I mean, you, know, you all know how that, those work. It's looking at frequency and, 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 and so on. Uh, we are the Republican Party, a big, broad, diverse, and inclusive party. Thank you for being part of this quest and working with us to restore the America, and so on. Uh, when I ran the same thing, I don't have the example here, when I ran the same thing on uh, uh, a file that consisted of all the speeches of the Democratic Convention, the first it came out with word salad. Um, why is that? Well, there, there were just no statistical regularities. The Democrats were here, there, and everywhere, but there, was no, there were no words that, that brought certain sentences to the fore as being paradigmatic of, of, of the Democratic approach. Um, so uh, uh, the right has been able to stay on message, um, but the right has also been very successful in uh, instituting a campaign of what you could think of as negative branding uh, of, of the left and, and, and of liberals uh, that's, um, that's at the heart of this ability uh, to shift the, the, well, not just to shift the center of gravity of the language, but to change the nature of what political discourse is about um, in, in ways that I'll uh, uh, come to in a moment. And because the right has been so successful with this narrative, this faux populist, bogus populist narrative, uh, they've been able to, they've been successful even when the speakers uh, who are delivering that story are not particularly effective. Okay, Ronald Reagan was born to tell this story about the heartland Americans and the effete liberals and so on and so forth. But what's interesting is that this story is effective even when you hear it from characters like uh, John Kyle or uh, Mitch McConnell or, or Bill Frist. People, speakers who don't only, not, not only don't have much charisma, but have arguably negative charisma. Um, <laughs> but yet, they're very effective in telling this story. Uh, and it's, it, it is, as I say, the song, not the singer, um, that, that really puts the right over, over the top here. Um, 
Let me give one example of this, uh, which I spent a, a bunch of time on in the book. Um, how has the right trashed the liberal label? There was a time when liberalism and the liberal label reigned supreme in American politics. In 1961, uh, the philosopher Charles Frankel wrote an article in the New York Times Magazine uh, in which he said, uh, anyone who today identifies himself as an unmitigated opponent of liberalism cannot inspire to influence on the national political scene. Uh, pointing out that even Southern uh, Democrats uh, railed about Northern liberals, but not liberalism in general. Even McCarthy uh, talked about phony liberals, but left open the possibility that he had nothing against a sincere liberal if ever he, he met one. Uh, accompanying that, that, um, uh, that article was this cartoon. I don't know if you can see it, but there are these politicians labeled uh, left-wing liberal, right-wing liberal, liberal liberal, middle-wing Democrat, and so on, all preparing to, to go on television and putting makeup on, and the makeup uh, Kits uh, bear names like New Liberal, Liberal Number no. 7, Liberal Eye Shadow, uh, and so on. Um, well, if, you know, if, if, if that cartoon were run 20 years later, those jars would all be full of vanishing cream. Um, within 20 years, uh, the liberal label, uh, well, at the same time this is going, at the same time this is going on, the word conservative is in complete disrepute. Uh, 1949, and, and for the next 15 years, the Wall Street Journal in, in 1949 writes uh, an editorial saying, if a banker is described as conservative, most people are more inclined to trust their money to his care. But if a man is described as a conservative in politics, then he's likely to be suspected of wanting to cheat widows and orphans and generally be a bad fellow, and so on. In, in short, conservatism in as much disrepute uh, at that time as, as liberal came to be. Within a short period of time, uh, by the 1980s, um, uh, the word liberal had acquired such negative connotations. It was, as Jonathan Reeder wrote in 1985, associated with profligacy, spinelessness, malevolence, masochism, elitism, fantasy, anarchy, idealism, softness, irresponsibility, and sanctimonious. Such negative Im implications that uh, democratic politicians were abandoning the word in droves. Timothy Noah writes in uh, the New York Times in 1986, given the aversion this word inspires in democratic candidates, Future civilizations sifting through the rubble may well conclude that liberal was a euphemism for pederast or serial killer. Uh, and by 1988, uh, in his speech to the Republican convention, Ronald Reagan can start saying, it's time, it's time to say the dreaded L word, and, and, and sticks that label, the L word, on liberalism, which, from, from which it's never uh, entirely recovered. Um, when you ask liberals nowadays, or you ask politicians nowadays, democratic politicians, uh, what about their affiliation, they'll either sometimes if they're in a friendly audience, call themselves progressives. Uh, or they'll say, oh, I don't believe in labels. Or as Howard Dean puts, well, if believing in a balanced budget makes you a liberal, then I'm a liberal. They'll pussyfoot around that question. But very, there aren't five people in the Senate uh, who will willingly uh, own up to being, to being liberals nowadays. Um, this, is, um, this is also shown in polls. Uh, in polls, around 30 to 35 percent of Americans describe themselves as conservative, 15 to 20 percent. Uh, describe themselves as liberals, the rest is middle of the road or moderate or something like that. And this is, result has been remarkably stable over the last 25 years. Uh, people, so, and, and people often take that result to say, well, liberals are only half as common as conservatives in America. Now, that's not quite true, because when you actually look at positions uh, that, that voters take on the issues, um, you see that the, the skewing is not that two-to-one skewing that, that, that comes to the labels. Uh, for example, just to take one example, only 11% of Americans in 2003 believed that the Bush tax cuts uh, would create new jobs, which is, after all, a, you know, a first principle of conservative uh, uh, ec economic thinking. And in fact, on, I'll come back to this, but on most issues, most voters take a, a sort of somewhat left of center position and large numbers of them take the positions that we associate with, with liberalism. They just don't own up to the label. Um, uh, one way you can see this, in fact, uh, is if you look at the word liberalism itself um, in proportion to conservatism, people continue to talk about liberals and, and conservatives in about the same proportions, but they use the word liberalism much less than they did, apart from that one spike in the Dukakis campaign when this all came to a head. Uh, the use of the word liberalism has been declining for the last 20 years um, because people tend to think of liberalism less and less as a political philosophy. They think rather of liberals as a lifestyle or personality type and so on. Um, according to the, the negative branding campaign that the uh, right and the Republicans have um, uh, pursued. Um, 
In fact, what the right have done is to brand, um, the branding you can think of from a linguistic point of view is just turning the connotations of a word into its denotation, the associations into part of the meaning of the word, uh, uh, so to speak. Um, and this is historically something that often happens with political labels. You think of words like Bolshevik or Tory or fascist or populist and so on. They once denoted a political philosophy or political group. Now they're mostly a, a matter of, of, of connotations. Um, and this has certainly been true of the democratic left as well. Uh, words like pinko and bleeding heart and egghead uh, have long histories as attempts to discredit uh, the democratic left. But this took a new form when the Republicans began to do it uh, in the early, 19, uh, the early 1970s, really, when, when, um, when the Southern stra Nixon stra Southern strategy began in earnest, or mid-1970s. Mid um, it had something, let me skip this. Um, it, it was, um, it, it correlated with an interesting shift in the way Americans thought about their social identities and the language they used to talk about their social identities as these consumerist terms came to take the place of older terms that denoted uh, social classes and categories. Uh, I looked at the, I was interested in the, the rise of the word lifestyle, which, which happened quite suddenly. Uh, at the beginning of the 1970s. In 1967, there were just seven instances of the word lifestyle in the Chicago Tri Tribune. By 1973, there were 30, over 3,000, right? It's just boom, this word came out of nowhere, uh, thanks in part to Charles Reich. Uh, it was the moment at which uh, words like trendy and yuppie and Gen X, all these sort of marketing categories, came into ordinary usage as a way of describing uh, American categories. Uh, the word preppy was redefined. Uh, the qualifications for being a preppy were relaxed from four years at Choate to an afternoon at Abercrombie and Fitch. Uh, <laughs> blue collar came to be used for you know any restaurant with brick, bare brick walls was a blue collar restaurant. Um, uh, and in general, this kind of consumerist categories um, came to stand in for old categories of class. And the Republicans took advantage of that. Uh, oh, this is the, the, in in, in in characterizing this new distinction uh, between middle Americans and uh, the rest of the country, a distinction uh, that uh, was introduced by Joseph Kraft in 1967. By, 19, um, by, 2000, uh, by 1970, Time magazine made uh, Mr. and Mrs. Middle America their persons of the year. Uh, and they characterized these groups in terms of their consumer habits, uh, baton twirling, not Herman Hesse. Uh, they um, they uh, went to Radio City Music Hall uh, and not uh, Old Calcutta and so forth. Um, and with this as background, uh, the right began to characterize liberals using these consumer categories. The phrase Volvo liberals came in around the late 1970s, a replacement for limousine liberals. Uh, the two seem close, but actually they're significantly different. Limousine liberals replies, implies upper class people with a lot of money. Volvo at the time cost about what an Oldsmobile did. It didn't imply uh, a, a, a greater income uh, than someone else, but a particular choice. It is, after all, um, a, a car from an ugly car from socialist Sweden uh, that people buy just because they think it's safe and whose name has a serendipitous gynecological resonance, uh, which... <laughs> Ex ex explains why Volvo and not Saab uh, probably was, 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 was given that line. Uh, products like white wine and brie and uh, um, uh, you know, cheese and, uh, and, so, and later cafe latte, all of the, always the light comestibles, the light fluffy ones. So Port and Stilton might also be you know, upper middle class taste, but they're too dark and strong uh, to stand in for the, the image you want to convey uh, of liberals. And um, it's uh, so, so developed this stereotype, um, which, from which I took the title of, of, of my book. Uh, this is drawn from a, um, I, I tried to get the video to work, but I couldn't. So it's drawn from a 30 second ad that the Club for Growth, which is an arch conservative growth that, that tries to keep conserv hold conservative feet to the fire, ran during the 2004 uh, Iowa caucuses. You see this couple coming out of a store. The announcer says, what do you think of Howard Dean's plan? to raise taxes by, on families by $1,900 a year. The husband says, what do I think? Well, I think Howard Dean should take his tax hiking, government expanding, latte drinking, sushi eating, Volvo driving, New York Times reading, she says, body piercing, Hollywood loving, left wing freak show, back to Vermont, where it belongs. Now, if you thought about this, it's demographically a little odd. You have this picture of like Marilyn Manson sitting on his porch in Brattleboro. <laughs> 
reading the New York Times and laughing so hard at Maureen Dowd's column that he chokes on his unagi cone. It just doesn't, <laughs> it doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, nonetheless, it's a very effective way of um, pulling together that whole nosegay of social, <coughs> geographical, sexual uh, stereotypes with which the right has successfully branded uh, American liberals. Um, uh, now it turns out, as I say, it's, it's, it's not even true. It turns out, for instance, that uh, the majority of Brie buyers in America, American Demographics Magazine has a, an article on this, the more, just so you know that it, there, you know, there are footnotes in it. Uh, American Demographics Magazine points out that the majority of Brie buyers in America are Republicans. Right? Not surprising. I mean, you know, look at, look at the locations, you know, look at the stores where you find Brie and look what's parked outside and there are a lot more Mercedes there and uh, so on. It's not, it's not something you find in inner city corner markets and so on. Um, nonetheless, whoever buys this stuff, it stands in perfectly for this stereotype that the right wants to convey of liberals. I mean, it's soft, it's pale, it's runny, it's French. Right? What, <laughs> what, better, what better product to stand in for the stereotype that, that the right is trying uh, to, to create? And the right has been very successful with this. Um, here, uh, these are just raw numbers which make the case uh, uh, pretty well. Look in the press, and this is uh, major papers, but it, it, this works for the, so if you just look at the New York Times, Washington Post, wherever you look. Uh, look at the press for the phrase working class liberal. Doesn't exist. Statistically, it just doesn't exist. Uh, you've got plenty of references to middle class liberals, you've got references to working class conservatives, actually more than you have to working class Republicans. Uh, but if you're working class and you vote for the Democratic Party, you're a, a Democrat, not a liberal. You could support, you could oppose the war in, in Iraq, you could support maintaining social security in its present form, you could support uh, extending government uh, health care, you su could support raising the minimum wage up and down the line of the, the positions that we think of as defining liberal positions. But if you can't afford the countertops that go with it, you can't be a liberal. Uh, the, 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 the right has been successful. And this is something, it's, again, it's the, the, the press just does it. I don't even think they think about it. It's just you, when you think of liberal, you think of people in the Berkeley Hills or San Francisco or uh, uh, the peninsula or the west side of Manhattan or Hollywood. You don't think of people, working people in, in America as being liberals. They may be Democrats, they're not liberals. That's a kind of stereotyping. Uh, that, that, that's a result of the right successful stereotyping of the label. Um, the same thing holds, by the way, I won't go into it for, for racial uh, uh, categories. There are no black liberals. There are no Latino liberals. There are no Hispanic liberals uh, in America, though there are plenty of black and African-American conservatives. To listen to the press, right? Again, you can be black, you can vote for Democrats, and then you're a Democrat. You're not a liberal. Um, all of this has contributed uh, to this uh, picture that the right has been trying to put together uh, for really since, as I keep saying, the, the Nixon years, of these two nations that's taken on a, a, a new and more intense form in the last uh, six years as it's been characterized in terms of red and blue. It's always interesting when political divisions are, are put in terms of these basic colors because there's a sense of something basic and, and, uh, and um, uncompromising, the reds and whites of the Russian Revolution, the reds and whites of the uh, English Civil War, the re whites and blues of the French Revolution, uh, always a sense of this absolute distinction. Uh, and so you, you have uh, uh, these people, Matthew Dowd, a very influential political uh, a Republican uh, operative, I guess you'd call him, who had a lot to do with this, uh, saying you've got 80 to 90 percent of the country that look at each other as if they were on separate planets. Uh, John White, a, 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 a political scientist who wrote a book about not since the Civil War has the country been so divided, but if you search on not since the Civil War, you'll find a lot of hits for that, for that very quote. Uh, people are saying this all the time. And um, Americans do, in fact, in polls say, yeah, the country's a lot more polarized than it was <laughs> I, I think it's interesting only because, you know, red states keep left, right, you keep right. I don't know if that was a mistake or, or you know, what, what somebody was thinking. But Americans do, in fact, believe uh, that uh, the country is more polarized and more basically polarized, uh, certainly than it was a generation ago, and probably a lot of Americans were, yeah, than, than since the Civil War. Um, and it's, um, <coughs> it's in virtue of the, the rights campaign to brand liberals and to, re to, to, to redraw uh, what were distinctions of class or political ideology as these cultural distinctions according to what we eat and what we, what we drive and, and so on. Now, in fact, um, if you ask people, as I say, what, 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 whether the country's more polarized than it was a generation ago, they say yes. If you then ask them about their attitudes about particular issues, 
uh, whether it's abortion or taxes or the role of corporations or race or women in American life and so on, they're more together than they have been at any point in the last uh, 25 years. And uh, this, is, um, this is something you see uh, in, in research that's carried out by people both on the left and the right. Alan Wolf, a liberal sociologist at Brandeis, uh, writes a book called One Nation After All, says the majority of Americans long for a sensible center and distrust ideological thinking and shows that on, on the basis of extensive interviews in a number of parts of the country that Americans are on the same page. Uh, Mo Fiorina, uh, a Stanford political scientist who's also at the Hoover Institution on the right, uh, writes a book called The Culture War, The Myth of Amer a Divided America, in which he says the simple truth is that there is no culture war in the United States, no battle for the soul of America rages, and documents that with extensive references to polls and so on and so forth, which show that the majority of Americans are in the center, actually a little to the left of center on most of these issues, and small numbers are on the, on, on, on the far left and far right. Now, that's not something you see if you look at Congress or at the media or at uh, what uh, Fiorina calls the political class, the people who are actively engaged in politics. They tend to be much, much more polarized in their attitudes, but they represent only a tiny proportion of the electorate. And the whole idea of a culture war, uh, in fact, you know, if you, the second you start redrawing those electoral maps with a little more subtle graphics, the, the, the red-blue distinction becomes much more uh, evanescent. Um, um, but the whole idea of a culture war really isn't true. In fact, the idea that these basic demographic distinctions, consumer distinctions, divide America into two nations uh, simply isn't true. Um, the differences that people talk about are fairly slight and superficial. I mean, the idea that we're more divided since any time since the Civil War, because I uh, like to listen to Leonard Skinner in my, in my Chevy Avalanche, and you're listening to Radiohead in your Prius, you know, that, that, isn't, that isn't the kind of division that, that kept us apart in the Civil War. You can go up to Sonoma County to to infinity on raceway and and, uh, and 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 see NASCAR and, and people do and they're you know they're rooting I went up there with my daughter and we we're holding glasses of, of, of Chardonnay as we look for Richard Petty come out of the <laughs> the pit area you know and, and so are a lot of other people if you hadn't if there hadn't been a Navy flyover you would have thought you were at a Kerry rally um, uh, the the leading I've got a lot of examples in the book the, the leading uh, radio, the number one radio AM radio station in Nashville is an AOR adult oriented rock that's Billy Joel. Right, uh, the first country station is actually only third. Uh, Will and Grace is the number one show among Republican women, which led, uh, although it's a, a, a show with a gay theme, which led the Republicans to buy time on the show because Karl Rove is no fool, uh, <laughs> and and so on. Uh, the idea that there is this deep cultural divide, like the idea that there's deep political divide, just is a creation of the right. Though lately you begin to see, and I could talk about this in the question period. Lately you begin to see. Democrats as well and liberals as well buying into this saying, oh, well, yeah, liberal and, and conservative reflect these two basic deep models of the family, for example. Um, it all comes, as I say, as, as a part of this effort to rewrite uh, these basic distinctions of class and ideology as these superficial cultural distinctions. David Brooks, a uh, conservative commentator from the New York Times, uh, writes, Americans don't see society as a layer cake with the rich on top, the middle class beneath them, and the working class and underclass at the bottom. They see society as a high school cafeteria with their community at one table and other communities at other tables. All of this adds up to a terrain incredibly inhospitable to class-based politics. Well, that's not the truth of it, but it's certainly the picture that the right has been working for a long time to put over. And in the course of things, and this is a, another story I tell a, a couple of chapters of the book, uh, they've redefined the basic vocabulary of American political life. Elitism, for example, elite, uh, used to be a word that more often, most often occurred in the neighborhood of words like corporate, financial, business, and so on. That's how it was in American newspapers 25 years ago. It's how it still is in British newspapers, left, right, and center, even Rupert Murdoch's Times. Uh, the phrase, phrases like commercial elite and uh, a corporate elite and financial elite far more common than media elite, for instance, in British newspapers. In the U.S., and even in, again, the so-called liberal media, that's not true. Media elite, academic elite, uh, um, Hollywood elite, more common now than business elite, sometimes by a factor of two or three to one, business elite, corporate elite, and so on. A shift in the meaning of that word uh, so that the elites are people like people like us who live on the coasts and, uh, 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 and, and, and drive whatever we drive and eat whatever we eat and so on, not the people, say, who own Walmart. Uh, they just don't figure in this picture at all. Uh, populist, in the same way, has been redefined. Uh, looking through the press recently, I've seen the word applied to, now there was a time when populist in America meant people who took the side of working people, 
uh, against what were then the elites uh, in, the, in the traditional sense of the term. Uh, nowadays, in recent years, I've seen the term applied to um, uh, uh, Steven Spielberg, that's Oscar de la Renta, the middle, the middle, middle of the top, who came out with a mid-price fashion line. Donald Trump, of course, a well-known populist, Arnold Schwarzenegger, uh, Bill O'Reilly, and of course, George Bush, who Peggy Noonan explains is the triumph of the seemingly average American man. There's nothing lemonade on the porch overlooking the links at the country club about Mr. Bush. He isn't, Mr. Bush, he isn't smooth. He actually has some of the roughness and resentments of the self-made man. You're not going to see Bush and self-made man in the same sentence an awful lot, even in, in the Wall Street <laughs> Journal. But, uh, but nonetheless, this picture of Bush as an ordinary guy whom people could, could talk to in their barbershop, who campaigns as a populist because he uses buses, is a very easy one to make precisely because this word has been drained of its class content and turned into simply a, 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 a cultural term that implies a certain down-home style. Um, all of this contributes to a view of political identities as no longer a difference in philosophy about economics or, or, or politics, but rather uh, differences in lifestyle, uh, differences in personality. You begin to see, if you track that phrase, the liberal or conservative mindset, it begins to take off uh, in the early 90s and become much more, much more common. Uh, or even political genders. Uh, um, you listen to these talk shows and you, and, 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 and you, you, you often have the feeling of listening to uh, kind of classical arguments between men and women. You libs, you liberals, uh, in the way in which people used to say, you gals. Uh, and I, I actually did a Google um, group search on that, and I'll, I could talk a bit about the, how you can and can't use Google numbers on these. Um, but you libs and you liberals is three, three to four times as common as you conservatives or you cons, um, uh, suggesting an interesting difference in attitudes. Um, What, what, what should liberals do? And I, just a few remarks at the end um, uh, to suggest some of the things that, some of the points that I think are important. Um, first of all, uh, in understanding that it's not about words, um, you have to understand it's not about either trying simply to assume words like values and the assumption you can neutralize them, or bailing out on words that have acquired uh, uh, negative uh, connotations like liberal. Um, uh, when I listen to the way liberals talk about being liberal, saying but there's nothing wrong with a progressive label, it's a fine label, but when you bail out on the liberal label or uh, disown it, uh, I think liberals think of themselves in something like the way Ford did when in 1960 they, they introduced the Edsel line. I'm not many people here remember that, but it was a, a, a new car. It looked like a Chrysler sucking a lemon, someone said. And uh, it was completely, uh, a complete disaster. And Ford bailed out on the Edsel uh, and um, kept making the same car, but as a Ford Galaxy, right? Just selling it as a Galaxy, and it do, did fine for another five years before they changed the body style. And I, I sometimes think liberals um, are doing the same thing when they adopt the word progressive. You know, we'll just change the name and nobody will notice it's the same car. Um, uh, that has allowed conservatives to define the L word uh, and move it increasingly to the left in, in some of the ways I've talked about. In fact, one of the striking things you see is that liberal has now outflanked leftist in some context. You'll see a reference, I saw a reference, uh, one South Carolina legislator talking about another legislature, legislator as one of the most liberal leftists we have in the House of, uh, the, 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 in, the, in the legislature. Now, 25 years ago, that would have sounded dyslexic, right? Because you could be one of the most leftist liberals, but not vice versa. But in, in a lot of, uh, of contexts, liberal is actually outflanked uh, uh, left is. So I think liberals have to own up to the L word. It's etched in the split screens of American, uh, the American media, uh, and, and they have to own up with it, even if they want to call themselves progressives as well. Um, second of all, liberals have to rediscover the populist, the true populist narratives that brought Democrats to the ball in the first place. Uh, Bill Clinton was very successful with this. Uh, in, um, in 1992, certainly. I'm tired of seeing people who work hard and play by the rules get the shaft. Could be a, a miniature movie summary, capsule summary from the, from the TV page. Stands in for a whole movie, you know what that movie's about. And Clint, it worked very well for Clinton. It worked well for Gore in 2000 after the convention when he started talking about the people versus the powerful until a couple of months later he got caught up in a whole bunch of other problems, abandoned that way of talking. Uh, but his numbers went way up when he started talking about the people versus the powerful. It worked for John Edwards in 2004 uh, who went from being an obscure first term uh, southern uh, senator uh, to coming damn close to getting the uh, Democratic nomination, might very well have gotten it had the Democrats not felt that they required somebody with medals in his lapel 
uh, to go up against Bush uh, national security. But again, with this traditional populist narrative. That isn't to say that <coughs> it's going to take the same form as the narratives that Harry Truman and Roosevelt uh, told. The middle class is a much more important constituency for the Democratic Party. Um, uh, the issues are different now. But you can also say that whether you're looking at the fear, um, uh, fears about health care, about pension security, um, about uh, rising housing prices, so on, up and down the line, the middle class and the working class have more in common now than at any time in the last 25 or 30 years. Uh, Robert Reich has made that observation. I, I think it's, it, it, it's a good one. Finally, uh, well, uh, th th what's the importance of this? The importance is to restore the identity of the Democratic Party itself. As I say, the Democrats do very well on individual issues. People give them the advantage on issue after issue after issue. Right now, they're even giving them the advantage, or at least they've neutralized the Republicans' advantage on national security, because the Republicans have been such a bunch of bozos. Um, nonetheless, the party itself uh, doesn't have the kind of clear image that uh, the Republicans do. Uh, recent polls, if you ask, the exes have a clear set of policies for the country. Uh, Republicans uh, outpoll uh, Democrats. The exes know what they stand for. The Republicans mightily outpoll Democrats. People do not have a sense that the Democrats know what they stand for. And the Democrats, up to now, haven't done much by way of uh, addressing that problem. I think they're hoping that they can make the 2006 election uh, simply a referendum on, on the Republicans and on Bush. They may very well succeed with that, at least at the extent of taking control of the House by a, by a narrow margin. But it isn't going to address this more deep problem of uh, political identity. Uh, There's another point that makes, I, I don't even, but to, I won't make this a cute point, but I'll, I'll skip it. Um, finally, um, uh, let me make it clear that when I talk about language and the importance of these narratives, I'm not suggesting that the Democrats' problems are essentially linguistic or that any essentially linguistic strategy will be sufficient to uh, restore the parties to political parity in, in this country. Uh, again, an automobile example. Um, you think about General Motors' attempts to restore uh, to, to save the, redeem the Oldsmobile line in the 1990s as sales were going down and so on. And they kept coming up with new names for these Oldsmobiles, the Alera, the uh, Allegra, the Aurora, the Sierra, the Achieva, and so on and so forth. Uh, they kept coming up with uh, ads that said, this is not your father's Oldsmobile and so on. And you know, people listened to the names, they looked at the car, and they said, you know what? That's my father's Oldsmobile. Um, <laughs> so, uh, it's clear, whether you look at commerce or politics, that names and slogans and, and, and wordsmithing, however clever, isn't going to do the job if, if there isn't a product. On the other hand, um, we all know examples of products that uh, were, were gangbusters products, but because they couldn't tell a coherent or persuasive story about themselves, weren't able to put themselves over in the marketplace. So I don't think of this as, I think the idea of language or policies is, 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 is a false choice. I think the Democrats need both. So let me stop with that, and thank you.